How you doing everybody? Welcome back to Stand Focus for Jesus. I am really, really excited about this sermon. This is a sermon that um, I spoke about a little bit and I had it in my notes that I was going to do a full in detail uh, sermon on what really happened in Genesis 1, the gap fact. So you're going to see some things that are going to blow your spiritual mind in a good way as God is my witness just bear with me as we make it through this um, just be patient with me as I make my points if you don't understand something uh, just let the video let the sermon play itself out and then all the pieces will come together so I also want to add before I get started since this video is being um, broadcast as a premiere I know that it does allow comments. Only thing I ask is that you keep your comments to a minimum. Don't go in the comments section trying to confuse people or you know trying to put your input on stuff. Think about others who are actually trying to listen and trying to uh, learn. I know watching the video you will have different thoughts and different things that you want to say, but just be considerate of others because even if I had the option, I wouldn't even have the comment section open. Because as I'm preaching, I'm not in the comments like that. I'm not in the comments while I'm preaching, while the video is rolling. So just be considerate of others. Um, let's do things in order, as the Bible says. And if you want to discuss it after the fact, hey, you can send me an email and you can call me. Or you can call me on my, on my business number. And we can talk about it on the phone. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get this thing started, y'all. I hope y'all are excited as I am. So let's roll, let's roll, let's roll. Isaiah chapter 28, verse number nine. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So if you don't completely understand what's going on in this uh, sermon or whatnot, then don't, ta don't take it personal. Maybe it's not for you, but you can still gain something out of it. Maybe you're still on the breast drinking the milk. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. So when the Bible is talking about dark sayings, it's not talking about this garbage that people uh they say in regards to backward sentences and all this other stuff. When the Bible is talking about dark sayings, stuff like that, it's talking about Proverbs, the deep wisdom of God. Luke chapter 12, verse number three. Therefore, whatsoever ye have so excuse me, therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear and closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. So this is what we are going to do. We are proclaiming what the Lord has spoken to me in secret, in my heart, in my spirit. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So we are privileged to be receiving this understanding that God has, has given us to understand. And I'm, I'm humble to even be able to, to make this sermon and bring it all together for y'all. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets the lion hath roared who would not fear the lord god hath spoken who can but prophesy so i'm doing exactly that the lord has spoken and i'm going forth and i'm giving the understanding of this uh this this prophecy seeing then that we have such hope we use great plainness of speech and y'all know I speak real plain. That's why a lot of times it takes me a 
ample amount of, amount of time to make it through a sermon because I break it down like a person, you know, saying like I'm just break, breaking out to the bare minimum, the basics. You know, I don't try to try to make things complicated because I know that we have people here that are learning on different levels. So the simpler that I can make it in the teaching by going point by point by point by point by point by point A to Z, then the easier it is to understand, the easier it is to digest the knowledge, the wisdom, and the understanding. So I just want y'all to understand that. Why I teach and preach the way that I do. Why my sermons are so long. I go point by point so that there's no confusion. And also God speaks to me with great plainness of speech, so I do the same thing to you. So in Genesis chapter 1, verses, um, verse number 1 right now, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Simple. Now, we must define what beginning is. Beginning, first entering upon, commencing, giving rise or original, taking rise or origin, the first cause, origin, that which is first, the first state, commencement, entrance into being, the rudiments, first ground or materials. Excuse me. So when we take that definition and we implement it, we implement the wisdom of that definition because y'all hear me say, say this all the time. Every word has its own has its own wisdom inside of it. Like when you say love, love isn't just a word that's empty. Love has wisdom contained inside that very word itself. So that's why definition, that's why words are so powerful. When you go into the definition and the meaning of a word, it gives you a better understanding of the context of what is going on. So in the beginning, in the first entering upon, in the commencing, in the origin, in the original, God created the heaven and the earth. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. The reason I brought this scripture up is because we have this, this, this notion of just because it says beginning, we think, I can't explain. We think, we think it's like, yeah, this is it right here. This is it right here. That's why I said we must have an understanding, a proper understanding of what it's actually talking about when it says the beginning. Let me give you a, a example. When I was born, this, we're going to go with my wife because my wife was born before me. When my wife was born, that was, in essence, her beginning. When I was born, that was my beginning. Where? In this physical world. But guess what? I was already thought about before I came to this physical world. So my beginning, my wife's beginning was this beginning on this earth when she was born. My beginning on this earth was when I was born. My son's beginning was um, on this earth was when he was born. But yet each one is are different beginnings, yet they are still tied together. But my son was already in my loins. He existed before he actually came into physical existence. My wife existed before she came into physical existence. Um, I existed before I came into what we call this physical existence. You existed before you came into this actual physical existence. So you have to have an understanding of just because it says the beginning doesn't mean it's talking about, oh yeah, that beginning right there, like, you know, the, the beginning beginning. Now, I'm not saying that does not apply to uh, what we read in the book of Genesis so far, but I just want you to have an understanding of that. And we will see what beginning is he talking about. It's going to be in that beginning when he created, but something happened prior to that, or we shall see. And you will be the judge of that. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Now, we're going to see some comparisons on something. 
in regards to what I just talked about. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of Man, abideth a priest continually. Now, if you don't know, Melchizedek is what we call the pre-incarnated Christ. Back then, he was known as Melchizedek. He was known as this is Jesus right here. When you do the, uh, the uh, you compare scriptures and you see about uh, the by his name, uh, being inter by interpretation, King of Righteousness, that's Jesus. King of Salem has to do with Jesus. Uh, King of Peace is Jesus. Today we call him Jesus Christ. Back then, he was Melchizedek. He wasn't coming to be Jesus, the Lamb slain. He was not coming then. He was coming as Melchizedek. And that's a whole sermon in itself. But Melchizedek, we see what? He, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. So how can he not have a beginning of days unless he is God? So notice that it didn't say God created the world or the waters during this time period of beginning. It did not say that when we read in the beginning. It did not say that he created the waters or the world as we know it. Why is that? So even if there is no gap between verses 1 and 2, which is what people call the gap theory, which is really gap fact, even if there is no gap between verses 1 and 2, but verse 2 is a, is a direct continuation of verse 1, something still happened to the world and earth. Something still happened. So if one and two are together and there is no gap between one and two, meaning that there was a world between a world, um, something happened between there which it was destroyed, then if one and two continue or a continuation of each other, something still happened. Something still happened. So can we prove that something happened regardless? Can we prove this? Genesis one two. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the words we're going to key in right now, key in on right now are form and void. Form, the shape or external appearance of a body, the figure as defined by lines and angles, that manner of being peculiar to each body which exhibits it to the eye as distinct from every other body. Thus we speak of the form of a circle, the form of a square or triangle, a circular form, the form of the head or of the body, a handsome form, an ugly form, a frightful form. It also means beauty, elegance, splendor, dignity. And here's a correlating scripture with that. Isaiah 53 verse number 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness in regards to Christ. He, had, he was not beautiful. He was not elegant. He was not somebody that people would desire as far as like attractive. And then it says, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So this is the context of this definition when it's talking about form in regard to this scripture. It also means determinate shape. So let's define void, empty, vacant, not occupied with any visible matter as a void space or place without inhabitants or furniture. The correlating scripture to that is 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse number 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. 
I told y'all, you know, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. The earth is like a house. It's like a house in the house of God. And these different planets, um, I almost got ahead of myself. I'm, I'm gonna say I'm gonna save that. But y'all know I talked about the planets that are to come. Those are going to be rewards that we are going to receive. Some of us are going to receive. And we're going to be going to these different planets. Um, and we're going to be setting up what we call today's civilizations. But they're going to be done. It's going to be done in righteousness. And you're going to be able to create a world if God gives you that authority. That's yet to be seen. Depends on the rewards he gives you. Uh, you will be able to go to these planets and you will be like a ruler over this planet. Because how can you be a king without something that you're ruling over? So he talks about with the cities and everything. He made the, uh, the his servants. He made them, when they brought back a return, he made them ruler over so many cities. Um, And then you go here and you you have your own, your own planet, your own world that you'll be able to create how you want to create it. But it will be done in righteousness. Um, I talked about that in another sermon. Some of y'all should remember. If not, it's something dealing with... um. Uh, lemonade when life gives you lemons make grow lemon trees or something like that so it also means having no legal or binding force no not effectual to bind parties or to convey or support a right not sufficient to produce its effect thus a deed not duly signed and sealed is void a fraudulent contract is void or may be rendered void it also means destitute unsupplied, vacant, unoccupied, having no incumbent, unsustain, un, unsubstantial, vain. So when we go back and we put that wisdom in there that we just learned, we have a better understanding. And the earth was without shape or external appearance of a body. And the earth was without determinate shape. The earth was with, without beauty, elegance, splendor, dignity, and void, and empty, vacant, without inhabitants or furniture, and void, and no legal or binding force. The legal or binding force of the earth to be the earth and the world to be the world is love. It was not there. I'm kind of giving it away um, some, some, some future points that I'm going to make, but I want y'all to go ahead and understand that. And it was what? It was destitute, unsupplied, unoccupied, meaning unoccupied with man. I'm getting ahead of myself, but, uh, bear with me. And it was what? Having no incumbent. It was unsubstantial. It was vain and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, if this is the correct understanding of this scripture, then we should be able to find correlating scriptures that pretty much say the same thing in regards to the definitions that we just defined. We should be able to find scriptures that correlate with those definitions. If that is the correct and proper understanding of what God is saying, um, in regards to the earth being without form and void. Can we do that? Can we do that? Of course. So if the earth was in this condition, then we have a problem if nothing happened to make the earth this way. Why you ask? Isaiah chapter 45 verse 18. For thus said the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So again, if the earth was without form and void, then how did it get that way? Because we see here it says God what? Himself, God himself that what? Formed the earth. We just read it said the earth was, was without form. He formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. Well, based off of definition, the understanding of the definition, 
we see that what the earth was not being inhabited by man and we know it's man specifically because of the, of the scriptures that we're going to read thus saith god the lord he that created the heavens and stretched them out he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein thus saith the lord the holy one of israel and his maker ask me of things to come concerning my sons and, and concerning the work of my hands command ye me i have made the earth and created man upon it i even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts have i commanded so he's pretty much saying that i made the earth to be inhabited by man i put man upon earth the heaven even the heavens are the lord's but the earth hath he given to the children of men so the earth is specifically given to us jeremiah chapter 4 verse number 23 here's the correlating scripture that goes with genesis uh chapter 1 verse number 2 i beheld the earth and lo it was without form and void in the heavens and they had no light so we read genesis 1 2 again and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters wow how did we miss that before how did we miss that before because the pastors they were not teaching this they were not teaching this I'm not saying this has never been taught but um overall because we know the amount of false prophets that are here in the world so what is the context of jeremiah 4 speaking about it's speaking about destruction it's speaking about destruction so if we can prove that jeremiah 4 is speaking about destruction and it says the same thing that genesis 1 2 is saying i beheld the earth and lo it was without form and void and the earth was without form and void then that means what that genesis genesis 1 2 there had to be some type of destruction can we prove what jeremiah 4 is talking about jeremiah 4 chapter 20 through 22 destruction upon destruction is cried for the whole land is spoiled suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment how long shall i see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet for my people is foolish this is why the this is why i was destroyed before this is why it's going to be destroyed again they have not known me they are sought as children and they have none understanding they are wise to do evil but to do good they have no knowledge then we read 23 to 25 i beheld the earth and lo it was without form and void in the heavens and they had no light i beheld the mountains and lo they trembled and all the hills moved lightly i beheld and lo there was no man and all the birds of the heavens were fled now when you read scriptures they apply multiple times they just don't apply uh to one time period there's nothing new under the sun so you can read one prophecy and it could apply right then but then god could be giving it from the perspective of speaking about something that happened in the past and we're going to see we're going to see that more as, as we go on but you can clearly see that jeremiah 4 is talking about more in detail what really happened in um genesis and then he's using it as an example for for those who knew he used it as, as an example for those who knew so they could so they could take heed to what he was saying then we jump down to 26 and 27 i behold and lo the fruitful place was a wilderness and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the lord 
At the presence of who? At the presence of the Lord. And by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate. Yet will I not make a full end. So we got a few words highlighted. We want to focus on, um, I think this right here, if I'm not mistaken in my notes. The fruitful place was, was a wilderness. Let's see. Let's get some more detail. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Remember, it was talking in the context of no man being there. Man is, is, is God's heritage. Man is God's heritage to carry on his legacy. His legacy of what? His legacy of love. To live in righteousness, to glorify him. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like all the plants round about thy table. But Nineveh is of old, like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is none in of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. She is empty and void and waste, and her heart melteth, and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all, excuse me, and the faces of them all gather blackness. So it's, it's the same, same type of context. She is what? Empty and void and waste. Speaking about Nineveh. So is there any more strong scriptural evidence that the earth being empty void etc is a result of god's judgment upon the earth who he gave to man isaiah chapter 24 starting at verse number one behold the lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof and it shall be as with the people so with the priests as with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth. And they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men left. Back to Genesis 1, verse number 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So we clearly see that there was a complete destruction prior to God telling Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Replenish. So what is replenish? It's two words which are re and plenus. Plenus meaning full. It means to fill, to stock with numbers or abundance. To finish, to complete, uh, to recover former fullness. Now some people will say, see, it says me, it means to fill, not to refill. Let's uh let's take it step by step. And let's see the context and how the word is actually used. And does it mean just to, to feel or is it more so to recover for, to former fullness? So we look at the word re. Re means back to the original place again, 
anew once more. So we go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 and it reads, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish and fill or finish or recover form of fullness back to the original place. Fill, finish, recover form of fullness again. A new fill, finish, recover form of fullness once more. So if they are filling it, if they are recovering, if they are finishing finishing it, if they are recovering it to its former fullness once more, that means that people had to be there before for them to do that. But we'll, let's get some more witnesses. We're not just going to have one witness. You know how we do. Genesis 9, verse number 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Let us remember the earth had just been flooded with a catastrophic flood, which is why God told Noah and his sons to replenish, recover former fullness again, the earth. So that is another scripture proving that when God is saying replenish, it means to recover form of fullness again so if he told adam and eve to replenish the earth he's telling them to be fruitful and multiply and to replenish the earth because the people that were there before they were destroyed off of the earth so there had to be people there before for the for him to tell adam and eve to replenish the earth <laughs> powerful stuff powerful stuff so we're going to call, we're calling redeem to the, to the witness stand. We're calling redeem to the witness stand because we want to bring in another witness to confirm it even more. What does redeem mean? To buy back, to ransom, to liberate or rescue from captivity or bondage or from any obligation or liability to suffer or to be forfeited by paying an equivalent to repurchase what has been sold to regain possession of a thing alienated by repaying the value of it to the possessor to rescue to recover to deliver from let's go to the scriptures are the scriptures that prove this wherefore say unto the children of israel i am the lord and i will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will rid you out of their bondage and I will redeem you with a stretch out arm and with great judgments. I will redeem, I will repurchase what has been sold. I will repurchase what has been sold. Leviticus chapter 25 verse number 29. And if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year may he redeem it. So if any man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may repurchase what has been sold. What did he sold? What did he sell? He sold his house. It within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year he may what? Repurchase what has been sold. What he sell? He sold his house, so he is redeeming it. He is buying it back. He had it at one time, and then he sold it, or he lost it, or whatever, whatever. And now he's getting it back, redeeming. So, replenish, putting something back that was once there. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem? us from all inequity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works so who gave himself christ for us that he might repurchase what has been sold we have been sold what unto he has he's buying us back from 
from all iniquity. He's buying us back from sin with his blood. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Meaning belonging to God. So we go back to Genesis verse number one, excuse me, chapter number one, verses two and three. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light and there was light. So we're going to address the latter part. Now we're going to address this latter part. So we go back to Jeremiah four, verse 23. It should pretty much say the same thing, right? It does. I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void. That's verse number two. And the heavens, they had no light. There go your verse number three right there. So let's get some more knowledge. Let's get some more wisdom. Let's get some more understanding and see why did God say, let there be light. And why was there no light in the first place? So, why did God say, let there be light? Was it a representation of something greater? And I can answer that for you. Yes, it was. Or yes, it is. Isaiah chapter 45, verse number 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Psalms 97, verse number 11. Light is sown for the righteous. And gladness for the upright in heart. Interesting, he says, light is sown for the righteous. Interesting, he says, he formed the light. He said he formed the light. They made it, he made sure that he said form the light, and he made sure that he said create darkness. He made sure that he said form the light, and he made sure that he said create darkness. He made sure that he said light is sown for the righteous. So if he's saying let there be light, let it be for the righteous. But we know that the world was destroyed. Oh, what happened after that? He told Adam and Eve to replenish. There was no sin when Adam and Eve uh, first got on the scene. Let's get some more scriptures. John chapter 3, verse number 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And men love what? Darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. You see, you've been you've been thinking about darkness as uh, uh, just a, just a basic thing. I think I'm getting ahead of one of my slides, but uh, we'll be all right. You you just think of darkness as, as I turn you turn the lights off. I turn my lights off, and then it's just dark. No, darkness is something that's literal. It's not just uh, just like you know turn your lights off. It's 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 real. You can feel darkness. Darkness has its own its own spirit to it. First John chapter one verse number five. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So if God said let there be light, what was he saying? Let there be let myself shine, meaning let Christ let Christ shine and create bring forth which is what he did second corinthians chapter 4 verses 3 through 6 but if our gospel be hid it is hid to them that are lost in whom the god of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of christ he was saying let there be love there was no love on the earth anymore who is the image of god should what shine unto them for we preach not ourselves but christ jesus the lord and ourselves your servants for jesus sake for god who commanded the light to shine out of darkness same thing as being said in the book of genesis have shined in our hearts to what to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ so when he was saying let there be light he was literally saying, let there be love again. Let there be Christ. Let Christ shine. Let Christ go forth and give the knowledge of the glory of God. 
unto what? Men. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 8. For ye were sometimes darkness. And notice how he words that. Ye were. He didn't say like, like or as. He said ye were. So he's saying that you were literally, we, we used to be, we used to literally be darkness. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as truth in the light. So we are literally light. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 14. Wherefore. He saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. He shall give thee life. He shall give thee love. So now we're calling John to the witness stand. So, John, in your first letter, are you, along with other things, testifying about Genesis 1? This is the question that we are posing to the Spirit of John. I need you to testify, John. John 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, Christ. And the Word, Christ, was with God, the Father. And the Word, Christ, was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. By who? By the Word. By Jesus. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, in who the word in Christ was life, and the life was what? The light of men, and the light what shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This is talking about Genesis, among other things. Then we jump down to verse 9. That was a true light. Who? Christ was a true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Powerful stuff. So then we go to Genesis 1, verse number 4. And this should line up perfectly. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. John 1, verse number 5. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So we go to Genesis 1, verse number 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. These are a representation of something greater. Something bigger was going on. He's speaking in a parable. He's speaking in a story. And those who have the wisdom that he's giving the wisdom to, he's letting you, he's speaking to you plainly, plainly letting you know what really happened, what this parable is about. And we're going to see that in some other scriptures. Because this stuff is not meant just for the average person that doesn't want to seek the Lord. This is for those who really want to seek the Lord, or who really are seeking the Lord. It's when a person reads it, it doesn't make any sense to them. They're like, oh, uh, this is garbage. Uh, this, this is, It doesn't make any sense. It's not supposed to make any sense to them. So don't be mad when people don't understand. It's not meant for them to understand <laughs> because they don't really want to understand. This is why this is so deep. So during this time period, God never says he created this darkness. He never says he created this darkness. Now, we read the scripture earlier where he says he created darkness. He creates the darkness, but he never said he created this darkness. Why? The darkness was already there. The darkness was already there. You don't have to create something again that's already that's still there. God also never says he created this light, but later... He says he created lights in the firmament, which are not the same as the above light. This is a representation of Christ. And you should know who this is. God also said the above, the above light called day was good, but never says the darkness was good. If the darkness was simply what we consider darkness, like you turn your lights off, why would it not be good? There's nothing wrong. There's nothing bad about you turn your lights off and you're going to sleep. There's nothing, there's nothing bad about that. So why didn't Jesus, why didn't the scriptures, why didn't, why didn't God the Father, why didn't the Holy Spirit, 
Why didn't Moses, why didn't he say by the spirit that the darkness was good? He said that the light, this light was good, that he called day, but he didn't say anything about this being good. The story is deeper than what you have been taught. So if we jump down to verses 16 and 16 through 18, we see what? And God made two great lights. This is your, your sun and your moon, which also are a representation. Remember we did the sermon before uh, while I was talking about microcosm universe. Like everything is a universe within itself. It's a pattern of everything. Everything is a pattern of something else. Remember we did that sermon? This is exactly what's going on. And God made two great lights. He didn't say anything about he made this light. He just said, let there. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule, o and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. I can go deep into this right here, but we got we to gotta stay the course. We got to stay the course. But this is like a microcosm of this. And this is a, a microcosm uh, of something even greater. Because the, the son was sent by who? The father. So the smaller lights, angels, are the greater lights, Christ. Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so so you have the great light christ and then the smaller lights that were created the angels the host of heaven so what is the earth specifically what is the earth specifically genesis chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. Notice what he says, and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas and God saw that it was good. So dry land is earth. Dry land is earth. Now, again, notice what? The dry land appeared. The dry land was covered in water. So we go back to Genesis 1 verse number 2. And we put all this together. We see what? And the earth, the dry land, was without form. Was without shape or external appearance of body. Without beauty. And void. It was empty. It was vacant. It was without inhabitants or furniture. It was destitute. It was a uh, vain. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The earth was completely covered in water from a flood prior to Noah's flood, in which God destroyed the earth and that mankind for its wickedness. If God said he made the earth for man, and that he did not create it in vain. This means people had to be on the earth. That became so wicked. God flooded the earth. In all actuality. He flooded the entire universe. And galaxies. But that's for another sermon. So. The whole. Uh, the dry land. The earth. Was covered in water. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. For the earth to appear out appear out of the water, it had to be covered in water. 
So we jump down again to Genesis 1 verses 9 and 10. And God said, let the waters. So brother, I see you <laughs> talking about that um, notification. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called the waters called he sees and God saw the and God saw that it was good. So for the dry land to appear, it had to be covered in water. There was a um um a universal flood. It's like, I, didn't use, I like to use that term, a universal flood. The universe was flooded and the galaxies were flooded. And guess what? They still are. But that's again, that's for another sermon. <laughs> I got so much I want to share with y'all in due time, Lord willing. So what about the darkness upon the face of the deep? Let's, let's break that down. Ephesians chapter six, verse number 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians chapter five, verse number 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of what darkness, but rather reprove them, expose them, light shine into the darkness. Second Peter chapter two, verse number four, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into what chains of darkness to be to, to be reserved unto judgment. First John chapter two, verse number nine. He that saith he is in the light, you see that? And hate of his brother is in darkness, even unto now. Revelation chapter 16, verse number 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was what? Full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. So let's break this down. Let's break this down. Let's digest this. And the earth, the dry land, was without form, shape, or external appearance of body, determinate shape, beauty, elegance, splendor, dignity, and void, which is what? Empty. It was vacant, without inhabitants or furniture, no legal or binding force, no love, destitute, unsupplied, unoccupied, meaning no man was there. It had been completely destroyed from man, mankind, and, and man was made in the image of God to... Uh, glorify God and live in the fullness of his, of his love and righteousness, having no incumbent, unsubstantial. It was vain and darkness, which is what? The rulers of this world, Satan's kingdom, sin, hatred, no love, was upon, which means resting or being on top or on the surface, the face, which is surface, of the deep, which is abyss, and the Spirit of God moved, which means set in motion, impelled, impelled means push, impelled toward action, upon resting or being on the top or surface, the face, which is a surface, of the waters. Now, I know that may be a mouthful. You're like, what? So we're going to break it down. We're going to make it simple to understand. And the dry land was without shape, beauty, or dignity, and empty, vacant of truth or love, and vain. And Satan and his kingdom of darkness, which has no love, was resting on the top, the surface of the abyss, and the Spirit of God set in motion with action to also rest on the top the surface of the waters. So if the world was covered in darkness with Satan being there, and then God comes onto that same surface where Satan is, because it says what? And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters where this darkness was covered was also on the face of the deep, the abyss, because the waters were covering the abyss. He was guard. He was in, in kind of like I guess guarding it. And but God came down. The spirit of God came down. And he he handled that. 
he handled it because he didn't want to go up in here. He didn't want to go in there. You're going to see that. You're going to see some amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. If your spirit isn't blown already in a good way, then I got some some way, way, some, I ain't going to say way better, but just some, some more stuff. So again, if the world was covered in darkness with Satan being there, and then God comes onto that same surface where Satan is, do you think it was a come to Jesus conversation? And then what happened after this? Afterwards, we see the days of creation and God then telling Adam and Eve to replenish. God, yet God was still being graceful to Satan. He was still being graceful because he could have, he could have, you, you ain't, that's it, you in hell and, you know, you, you're not getting out. So this is what happened in Genesis. This is what really happened. That's why he told them to replenish the earth. Because it had been destroyed before. It had been destroyed. So it's not a gap theory. It's a gap fact. And some of you know about the gap theory. And you know it's a gap fact. But maybe you didn't know, maybe you didn't know these details about what actually happened. So now we want to address the trees in the garden. Because... <laughs> People think that the trees were just trees in the garden. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't trees. There were trees in the garden. There were literal trees, just like we have trees here on earth. And we cut them down and we use them, stuff like that. There were literal trees that, that were there. But the trees were a representation. They symbolized something else. In the same way, the trees of this world, they symbolize and they represent something else. You know why they don't, the certain lands that they, they don't touch, they call it, uh, it's, it's protected. Because those protected lands, they are a representation of the body of Christ. They are a representation of the trees of God today, which is us. Maybe say, I ain't never heard that before, brother. Now, you know I'm going to give you the scriptures. I'm not just going to tell you something off the top of my head that I'm not going to give you the scripture to bag it up. Now, watch this. This is so amazing. So amazing. The word of God is so powerful. I'm, I'm kind of upset because we were not taught these things. We were not properly taught what went on. And so we go about, um, you know, not having the answers and people make a mockery of the word of God, you know, when because we can't explain what really happened. We can't make sense of it. But now, guess what? You can make sense of it. So I want you to learn these things. If you got to watch the video two or three times, you do that so you can have an understanding. And you go forth with the knowledge, the wisdom, and understanding that you have been given, and you do what you're supposed to do with it. Because if you're watching this video and you're not doing nothing with the knowledge that you, that you have been given, then you're going to be in trouble. I don't make videos for you to just... Uh, sit down and eat popcorn and then go about your life afterwards. No, 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 no. So the trees in the garden, let's see some amazing stuff. Let's see what these trees really were about. Genesis chapter two, verses 15 through 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree, of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So he told man, Adam, to what? He gave him, he gave him the power to dress it and to keep it. To what? To dress and keep the garden and also these trees. These trees. They were, you can say, entities. Maybe even people. Because we know the word says, be careful when you entertain strangers. Because sometimes uh, you may have, you may entertain, you may be entertaining uh, um, an angel unaware. I'm sorry, I know I, know I messed that up. But y'all know what the scripture says. They... There's a, there was a certain one, certain tree that was mad and upset because God had given Adam 
this type of authority. There was a certain tree. There was a certain tree in the Garden of Eden that got, he was upset at this. He was very upset. Now he had already lost his, um, his power over the, over the earth, meaning when he used to rule the earth. And I did a sermon on that before, how Satan used to rule the world. He used to rule the world. That's how the earth was destroyed. He used to physically rule the world. God had given him that power and authority. And he got puffed up. And then the earth fell into uh, the same thing that's happening right now. And it was ultimately destroyed. That's what happened when we just read the destruction. That's what happened. Some of you know that because you remember me doing that sermon on it. So now I'm tying it all together. If you didn't know, now you know. So he told them, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Then we jump down to Genesis 3, verses 2 through 5. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. People think that this, is, this was a snake. The snake is a symbolization. The snake is a representation. She wasn't talking to a, a snake. The serpent represents wisdom. The serpent represents wisdom, represents, represents knowledge, represents uh, um, understanding, represents these different things. That's what the serpent really represents, ultimately knowledge. Not what we have been taught by popular belief. That's uh, that's the, that's the, that's folklore. It's folklore. It's the serpent ultimately ultimately represents wisdom. Even going back to ancient Egypt, the serpent was a representation of wisdom, of uh, you know, some protection stuff like that. That's why uh, he said, as the serpent was uh, lifted up in the wilderness, so so the son of man must be also lifted up. If you if you go with the notion that the serpent is the serpent itself is like, oh, the serpent is snake bad, Satan, Satan, Satan. Then it doesn't make any sense when, if you say that Jesus had to be lifted up like the serpent. It doesn't make any sense. But when you have an understanding of what serpent actually represents from a biblical standpoint and have the deep wisdom of God, then it makes that much more sense. You had Satan and his wisdom. And then you have God and his wisdom. It's the battle, really the battle of wisdom. And we know the serpent, he got his wisdom from God. He just twisted. Serpent wants to be the, save, the savior. He wants to be the Messiah. The Antichrist, he wants to be the Messiah. He wants to be the savior. He wants to be the light bearer. He wants to be the one who, who, who gave light, who gave life, who gave love, who gave enlightenment to man. That's what, it's, that's what the battle is about. So now you should have a better understanding of that. So it continues on. It says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God have said, ye should not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye should not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye should be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, this is this is this is your the oh my god. This is your false prophecy right here. What did he do? He mixed truth with lies. He mixed truth with lies. You say, how did he mix truth with lies, brother? I gotta highlight it right there. I gotta highlight it right there. He told him, Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He didn't lie when he said that. He did not lie. He lied about the, the latter part. He was being deceptive, but he did not lie about this part right here. He was mixing truth with lies. Same thing that these false prophets and false teachers are doing today. They are mixing truth with lies, presenting themselves as an angel of light, an angel of love, presenting themselves as Christians when they really are not. Now, the, these trees that God told them that they could eat from, except this one, all these trees, this is the wisdom that these, these, um, these, um, I don't know the right word to use. Um, but just bear with me. We're going to, we're going to say P 
people slash entities. The people that the people that were here. They, they were in the form of people. That's what they were. These trees were people. Entities that were there in the garden that Adam and Eve could go to to learn and gain knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. He may be saying, that's, I don't know about that. Again, you already know if I say something, I got the scriptures to bag it up. And not only one scripture, but two scriptures and multiple scriptures. So we want to address this right here first. Satan did not lie. Let's prove it. Genesis 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Who said it? The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. What does Satan say? Ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. Satan didn't lie when he said that. God confirmed what he said was true. He didn't lie when he said that latter part. That's why he told him. That's why he said what? No. But we, um, he put his hand forth so they couldn't eat from it. So they couldn't be gods. Satan is a god. So he was like, Satan was telling Eve and ultimately also telling Adam, hey, you can be like me, pretty much. You can be like me. Now, if God didn't do what he did right here, then Adam and Eve would have been messed up. They would have been messed up because they would have been they would have been like that. They would have been gods. That's why he said, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. If they would have ate from that tree of life and lived forever, then they would have been gods and they would have been stuck. They would have been stuck like Satan. Because Satan is a god. He knows the difference between good and evil. He has already eaten from the tree of life. That's why he can't never die. That's why his judgment is eternal. That's why his judgment is eternal. Now, because the power of God has been manifested to become gods in righteousness, therefore, everybody that rejects how to become a God in righteousness, because we have all now eaten of this, this, this curse of the knowledge of good and evil, it's, it's because of what Adam and Eve did. Now, because of that, you have to come into the spirit of God to become a God, knowing good and evil and living forever through Christ. If you reject it now, then you also receive the judgment of Satan, of Lucifer, because of the manifestation of Christ now. That's why that's why it has changed because Christ has been manifested. And there's no excuse. So now let's get even deeper and let's see that these actual trees were people or entities in the garden. So we are in Ezekiel chapter 28, starting at verse number 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him. So he's talking to the king of Tyrus at a time, but listen to what he says. You're going to see that this is not just a regular king he's talking about. He's just talking about Satan, who we call Satan. Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. But he calls him what? The king of Tyrus. You know why? Because Satan has lived the same nightmare over and over again. The phoenix rising from the ashes. He has to continue living the same nightmare over and over and over again. Dying over and over and over again. Trying to continue to, um, to try to exalt himself up never never succeeding always always having to die that's why in the movies when you see the time travel movies 
what are y'all trying to go back and do? They always trying to try, go, go back and change something to change the future. They end up getting stuck and they end up making it worse. <laughs> that movie, those movies that are like that are based off of, off of this, off of this. Satan has lived the same nightmare over and over again. Think about the butterfly effect. He kept on going back and he, I got to change it. I can fix it. I can fix it. I can fix it. And it kept on getting worse and worse and worse and worse. He kept on going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Think about the movies where a person wakes about to sleep and then they, they go through the motion like, I already did this. And they, in some end up happening, they wake up again. They keep on doing it over and over and over again. Satan has to, has to do that. He did it as the king of Tyrus. The king of Tyrus at, his, at this time, he died. He was a king and he watched his whole kingdom crumble and he was killed. He died like a mere man. So he says, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Simple stuff. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created thou art the anointed cherub that covereth so we clearly see again that this is talking about who we call satan and i have set thee so that was upon the holy mountain of god but he calls him the king of tyrus thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till what? Inequity, till sin, transgression of the law, was found in thee by the multitude of thy merchandise. So we'll, this is what we get for the love of money is the root of all evil. That's why under, Nis, under Nisara, he's going to release all that money. He's going to use money to have people to uh, turn, against, turn against God. They're going to love money. They're going to sell their souls literally for, for money, for the multitude of, of merchandise, just as Satan did. They have filled the midst of thee with violence. For the love of money is the root of what? All evil. And thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. And it came to pass... Uh, where we at? Ezekiel chapter 31 verse starting at verse number one. And it came to pass in the 11th year in the, in the third month, in the first day of the month that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Remember that speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt and to his multitude. Whom art thou, whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold the excuse me. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar, a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches, and with a shadowing shroud, and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. Boughs. So he's talking to the king of Egypt. He's talking to the Pharaoh. He's 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 using the Assyrian, which is interesting because we know the Bible references. The Assyrian as the Antichrist. The Assyrian hasn't came yet. He was. He was. The beast that was, that is, and is yet. Or yet is, I think it says something like that. Can't remember, but y'all know what it says. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about his plants. And sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. This is all a parable. It's all a parable of something deeper. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field. Why is it referencing the Assyrian as like a tree? His boughs were multiplied. His branches became long because of the multitude of waters. Multitudes of what? People. When he shot forth, all the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. 
under the shadow what of this giant tree. He was a he was a, a giant tree, a protection for what all great nations. But he was represented as a tree. So we go to Ezekiel thirty one verses seven through nine. Thus was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The what? The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. He was so tall. He was so great. He was so beautiful that the these trees couldn't even hide him. The, the fir trees were not like his bows, boughs. And the chestnut trees were not like his branches. Nor any tree in the garden of God was was nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. Him where? Him was a tree where? In the garden of God. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Now these were just regular trees. Why in the world would trees be envying him? You see? You see? There were different families, you can say, during this time period of what we call the gap fact. Satan, when he was Lucifer, and he had rule over the earth, he was ruling over his group of people because branches they represent people also they represent people so it says i have made him fair by the multitude of his branches by the multitude of his his people his growth the people had attached themselves to him we're gonna see that i told you i got i got some deep stuff for y'all so we see that well again so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. So when it talks about the trees that were in the garden, it's not, there were little trees there, but it's, it's a parable. The story is deeper than that. Now you know what the trees really were in the garden. We were folk, we, we were so focused on, oh, the trees, yeah, the trees, and, you know, apple, when the Bible never says anything about it, it was an apple. The fruit that they ate was a knowledge that they were not supposed to eat because God did not want them to eat it yet because they were nothing but children. They were nothing but children, and God, God was going to uh, reveal what he wanted to reveal to them in his timing. But Satan did what he did. So we go back to Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. So what were these trees that they could freely eat from except the what? Except this tree. These trees were what? The cedars, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. Again, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. We jump down so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden envied him of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat free freely eat they could eat the knowledge the wisdom and the understanding that these people you know we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna roll with people I don't know I don't know what form they were in I don't I don't know that I gotta be honest I don't know I don't know what form they in I believe they were in the form of um of like you nothing know, like like a man I believe they were in that form because you see other scriptures where angels come and they, and the people they come to, they see them as a man. So that's, that's why I said, that's why I say people. And I also using the word entities. So again, the, tr the, the trees that they could eat from of the garden, freely eat from, they were people entities that were in the garden that had knowledge wisdom understanding that they had gotten from god wow simply amazing simply amazing but we got to confirm all this we just can't be you know 
talking about trees or people and all this other stuff, even though we've already proved it, what these trees really were in the garden. We just, we just, we got to get some more, some more witnesses. So we go to Ezekiel 31 verses, uh, we're starting at verse number 10. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height and he hath shot up his top among the thick bows and his heart is lifted up in his height. I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness and strangers, the terrible of the nations have cut him off and have left him upon the mountains and in all the valleys. His branches are fallen. His bows are broken by all the rivers of the land and all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches to the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height. So if these were just trees God was talking about, then why would he talk about these trees are not going to exalt themselves for their height when this tree falls? If these were just trees, neither shoot up their top among the thick bows, boughs. I like, I like to interchange the words. Y'all just bear with me. <laughs> Neither their trees stand up in their height, all that drink water. Why? For they are all delivered unto death, to the nether parts of the earth, in the midst of the children of men, with them that go down to the pit, go down to hell. So these trees, they will not exalt themselves no more because they going down to the pit, they going down to hell, just like the, um, the tree that they were under. The big tree, Satan, Lucifer. For they, what? All the other trees are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth, the lower parts of the earth, in the midst of the children of men, with them that go down to the pit. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. So when he went, when he died, when he, when he fell, right? what he do? I covered, I covered the deep for him and I restrained the floods thereof. Told you the earth was completely flooded. The universe was completely flooded. The galaxies were completely flooded with water. That's why the planets, the planets now, they are what? They're dry land. There's no, there's no water on there. There used to be signs of water. He made the he made the dry land appear. Was what happened here on Earth is a microcosm of what happened in what we call the universe or or in this galaxy also the Milky Way what we call the Milky Way. That's why the planet again the planets they 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 have no water on them they're dry they they're Earth he said the dry land is Earth. <laughs> Why? Because there was a what we call a universal flood. The whole universe was flooded. And when he made the dry land appear, he also made the dry land appear on the other planets because that was a a, a shadow of what happened here on, on Earth. It was a, a type and a shadow of what happened also in the universe. And the great waters were stayed. And I caused Lebanon to mourn for him. And all the trees of the field fainted for him. Again, if these were just regular trees... Then why would he be talking about the trees are going to trees burning in hell and being brought down and all these, all these other things? So let's keep this in mind right here. He said, well, I covered the deep for him and I restrained the floods thereof. Now watch this. Well, not yet. I'm going to continue forward. I'm getting ahead of myself. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall. When I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit and what all the trees of Eden. Wow. <laughs> the book of Genesis, the story of Genesis is deeper than what you thought. 
Why won't, why aren't the pastors teaching us this? Why aren't the so-called pastors teaching us this? And all the trees of Eden, what? They went down to hell with him. <laughs> the choice in the best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him. <laughs> oh my God, I love the word of God. Are y'all excited about this? Are y'all excited about this? Unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm or his strength, that dwell under his shadow, under his protection, in the midst of the heathen, so there were heathen there too, during this time period. To whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, saith the Lord God. So he said the same thing that happened to Satan, Lucifer, the serpent, and all the trees of Eden that followed with him, the same thing was going to happen with to Pharaoh and his multitude because the Pharaoh was a type of Antichrist. He was a type of Satan. The Pharaohs were incarnated with the spirit of Satan, in essence, having to die over again and live in the same nightmare over and over again. The fall of Pharaoh was a microcosm of what happened in Genesis 1 and 2, between, you know, in between it, the gap fact. It was a microcosm of that. Ezekiel 17, starting at verse 22. Let me make sure. Let's go back. Yeah. Ezekiel 17, starting at verse 22. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the high, highest branch of the high setter, or cedar, and will set it, and will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one, and will plant it upon a high mountain and eminent. In the mountain, of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing, in the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell, and all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree. I have exalt, excuse me, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. Mm -mm -mm. Zechariah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. How, fir tree, for the cedar is fallen. Because the mighty are spoiled, how, O ye oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage is come down. Judges chapter 9, starting at verse number 7. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the mount, excuse me, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them hearken unto me ye men of Shechem that God may hearken unto you the trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them so he references he calls them men and then he speaks to them speaks to them in a parable and calls them trees and they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Shall I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness, 
and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees. Then said the trees unto the vine, come thou and reign over us. You should see what's going on. Speaking in a parable. Genesis is speaking in a parable. It's literal, but it also is, is metaphorical. It's allegorical. Uh, it's, 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 it's many things. And the vine said unto them, should I leave my, my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, come thou, and reign, come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, if in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Mark chapter 8, starting at verse number 23. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hand upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. <laughs> And after that, he put his hands, hands again upon his eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. Mark chapter 11, verse number eight. And many spread their garments in the way and others cut down branches off the trees and straw them in the way. This is a representation of you supposed to be laying your life down. They took branch. They took branches off of the trees. The tree you supposed to you supposed to bow down to the king. You supposed to bow down to uh, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, who created the trees, who created man. This is what this is a representation of. Prove it, brother King. Prove it. Romans chapter eleven, starting at verse fifteen. Excuse me. Now, here Paul is addressing the uh, Gentiles, and he's getting on them because they are boasting themselves against the natural branch. They are boasting themselves against, excuse me, Israel. The same thing is going on today. Many Gentiles of the flesh, they are boasting themselves against um, the Israelites of the flesh. For, th for the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, the casting away of Israel, what shall the receiving of them be? But life from the dead. For the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, so that shows you and tells you who the branches are, and proving what I just said earlier, well, just a scripture ago, right here, what that really represents we're supposed to be laying ourselves down laying our lives down bowing ourselves down to christ because he is the king of kings and the lord of lords and if some of the branches be broken off and thou being a wild olive tree were graft in among them among who the natural branches the natural tree and with them partakes of the root and fatness of the olive tree boast not against the branches boast not against um uh physical born israelites but if thou boast thou bearest not the root but the root thee that will say then the branches were broken off so he's addressing them again that i might be grafted in well because of unbelief they were broken off and thou Standest by faith, be not high minded, but fear. And he goes in to say that if they were broken off and God did that to them, they were natural branches, then what does that mean? What does that mean for you if you don't continue in faith? So people, oh, it doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile, taking scripture out of context. Here Paul is addressing Gentiles of the, of the flesh specifically. So it didn't matter that he wouldn't have been addressing them like this. He wouldn't have been telling them to boast not against them. Um, um, natural natural uh, Israelites, Jews of the, of the flesh. 
if it didn't matter. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail, severity, Israel, but toward thee, physical Gentiles, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. That's when it, that's when it that's what excuse me. That's what it means when it says that all Israel shall be saved. Because true Israel are those who are physical born Israelites, the natural branches who also uh, have the spirit of Christ dwelling in them by being born again. That is who true Israel is. The word of God says that everybody that is of Israel is not Israel. Just because a person is of Israel, meaning they were born of the physical stock of Israel, doesn't mean that they are Israel. Israel really don't have no choice but to be saved because they were sent here specifically by God. They were predestinated to uh, be saved. That's when you get into the whole predestination thing. Just because somebody's predestinated doesn't mean that other people can't be saved like Calvinism teaches. It means that they were specifically set apart for a specific purpose. They were specifically set apart for a specific purpose. They were going to be saved regardless. Of course, they didn't know it at the time, but God knew it. And then when they came into the knowledge, then God revealed those, those different things to them in that understanding. Because if they came into the world and they already knew, then they wouldn't have fulfilled what they were supposed to be fulfilling. They would have went directly to who, who they were supposed to go to um, and not having an understanding and learning what they also had to learn while they are also here in this flesh. But toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. So if a, a Gentile is claiming to be a Christian and, and they don't continue in his goodness, they will never save in the first place. So they will be cut off. So he allows them to be to speak for him, but it comes a point in time where if they are not completely grafted in, where they have grown into the tree, they will be cut off. And they also, who? The natural branches. If they abide not still in unbelief, if they come out of unbelief, uh, come into repentance and believe in the gospel, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. He didn't say anything about the Gentiles, physical Gentiles being grafted in again. This is, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So if you are a Gentile of the flesh, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. If you are a natural branch, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for you to be grafted in again. You were already in, you got put out. Now you need to come back in and be grafted in by God. This is your last chance. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and work graft in, excuse me, and work graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree. How much more shall these, the natural branches, which be the natural branches, be graft into their own olive tree? So he says that he, after that he said that you should be rejoicing that um that the natural branches are being grafted in because uh, that that means that you get that much more rewards and stuff. That means that we can go on with our life and not have to continue in this life that we are in right now. So it's good that the natural branches, natural born Israelites, that they are waking up to their identity and stuff. It's good because that means that it's all coming to a head. It's, it's all coming to a, to a close. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. So this was a mystery. The mystery has been revealed. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceit. Do not be wise in your own conceit. That what? That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the what? Fullness of the Gentiles become in. They are blind to who Christ really is. That's why you have these Hebrew or so-called Hebrew Israelite camps. That's why you have these brothers out here on YouTube that are speaking so much truth, but then they don't completely understand who Christ is. They are still blinded. They're still blind in part. Me, myself, I'm, I'm not part of the blind. 
I'm part of the group that was chosen to um not be not be blind. I praise the Lord for that because I could easily be a Gentile of the flesh. I could easily be part of this group that was that's that's blind that doesn't understand these different things I'm preaching now, or understands it but doesn't understand who Christ really is. I run into these brothers all the time. They have so much knowledge and wisdom, but they don't understand who Christ really is. So I, I'm humbled to actually be able to to be a part a part of this uh, this group and be a part of um, um, to actually play my part in this time is is very humbling. Now I take I take what I've been tasked with very very serious, and no matter what part you play, no matter who you are in Christ, you should take that part very serious because we all play a part. We all play a part. Your part is is important too. Your part is important too. So we go to Luke chapter three, verse number nine, and it reads, and now also the ax is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, cast into hell. Notice he's referring, referencing trees to what? To people. Luke chapter six, verses 43 and 44. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by, by his own fruit. For thorns men do gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. Jude chapter 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity. So talking about false prophets, false teachers, also false converts. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they what? Feast with you. They are among you just like trees. Trees are what? Next to each other. Feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. Carried about of winds. Trees what? Whose fruit withereth without fruit. Twice dead plucked up by the roots. So false prophets are what? They are symbolized by trees whose fruit withereth without fruit. Twice dead plucked up by the roots. Revelation chapter 11, starting at verse number three. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are what? The two witnesses, which are people. These are the two olive trees. I forgot they are, um, forgot where they mentioned that, but they are mentioned in the Old Testament. And the two candlesticks. So candlesticks also can be a representation, or candlesticks are a representation of what? Of people or a collective. So when it talks about the seven golden candlesticks, and that they are before the throne of God in heaven, then that tells you that the seven golden candlesticks, they represent the seven churches. And if they are before God, if they are before the throne in heaven, that means that what? They have been caught up. So people that talk about there's no such thing as a rapture or what we call the proper biblical term, no catching away, they have no idea what they're talking about. And I have a sermon on the mystery of the seven golden candlesticks. I'm going to redo it because it's been a while. I'm going I'm to redo it. But again, he said the two witnesses of what? These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the, for, before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So if these were just trees, you know, and they weren't men, then why would it matter if they were hurt? Why would fire be proceeding out of, out of the mouth? Fire is going to proceed out of these trees. We, we, we see what's going on. I'm just giving you more evidence that the trees in the garden, they, they were more so, uh, people, uh, uh what we call right races, nations of people, different type, different type of, uh, people. And Satan had a rulership over um, his people. And he was not supposed to mess with God's people, which was Adam and Eve. 
who ultimately, um, we know Christ came through that lineage. He's, Christ was supposed to come through that lineage and then rule over all, all of them. But it didn't turn out that way. It didn't turn out that way. We know how it turned out. So that is the end of my sermon. I pray and I hope this was edifying for you. <laughs> I pray and I hope that this blew your spiritual mind in a good way. I pray that this gave you some deep knowledge, some deep wisdom, some deep understanding. I pray it really let you know what really happened in the book of Genesis. I pray it gave you a better and a deeper understanding of the word of God. I pray that it it, it this video has you to seek the word of God that much more. Um, I pray that the light that's within you is just shining that much more brighter. Um, I, I thank God for, you know, having me in this position to even be able to bring the sermon together with y'all. Cause when I was studying, studying it and everything, uh, it, it was just simply amazing to me. And I, I'm very, I'm very humbled. Um, like I said, to be able to even for God to even give me this level of knowledge and wisdom and to be able to present it in a way where it can be understood. So, um, praise God, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, if you got any questions, you want to talk about this, you know, then shoot me an email, um, and give me your number and we can talk on the phone. Give me your number. And we can talk on the phone. But other than that, I love y'all. This is why I do this. I love y'all. I love the Lord. I want y'all to be fed in the same way God has fed me and continues to feed me. And I'm going to continue to feed y'all with, with um, sermons like this and with other things, rather they be deep, rather they be, um, you know, basic stuff, as long as the Lord allows me. As long as the Lord allows me. Um, but yeah, God bless each and every one of you in Jesus Christ's name. As always, stay focused for Jesus. And as you know, Truth is not debated, it is declared.